It's so good to see you here. I'm going to start uh, with some announcements. Uh, first, if you haven't heard, our pastor is down with COVID, and so we want to keep him in our prayers. Carolee's not feeling well, so we need to just lift them up. Um, and then due to that one announcement, I, I would first want to say we had a great response to um, gaining volunteers for our Harvest Fest. Um, I appreciate all of those that would put their names down and were willing to come. We are, under the circumstances, going to postpone that event for now as a cautionary um, provision. We want to keep everyone safe. We don't want to take any chances. We will be planning something in the future. Um, and so we just wanted to, if you were signed up, thank you. Remember that you were willing to do that for the next event that we do. <laughs> but we, we just want to do the right thing and, and keep everyone safe. Also, um, our Thanksgiving food names, if you know somebody that needs a, a Thanksgiving basket for a meal for Thanksgiving, the deadline is the 31st, and I believe that's this Saturday. Oh. No, oh, okay, so November 15th. So you do have a little extra time there. And you see Barbara or Sandy, or you can sign up. I saw a sign up on the wall in the foyer, okay? So if you know somebody that could benefit from that, we would appreciate that knowledge. And then um, we have our first Wednesday night movie coming up on the 3rd. And then Country Gospel Sing is November 5th. And so we want to be supporting that as well. We have until November 14th for Operation Christmas Child. So we want to get those boxes out. I just got a picture from, um, from Carolyn Lyman, who was in Thessalonica, Greece. And she had a picture of a friend that she had made on the trip. And it said, we just found out that we both love the Johnsons. And it was somebody from Jerry's past and a dear friend of the family. And so that was fun. She's connecting with people here way over in Greece. And she had a big old smile. So you just, and then um, this week they're going to be walking the, the roads that the Apostle Paul walked. That would just be so amazing. I zoomed in so I could see all the, the background behind her. And it was just, it was amazing. Let's just take a moment and take a breath. And let's just go to our Lord in prayer and thank him for this day. Father God, you are a good God. And we praise you that you love us enough to allow us to be in communion with you. May we not take that for granted. May we not take that lightly. But we, may we bask in your presence. When we are filled with joy, may we share that with you. When we are filled with struggle and confusion, sorrow, may we bring that to you, and may you fill our cups to overflowing. But the important thing, Lord, is help us remember to come to you. And Lord, we just want to lift our pastor and wife up to you. Father, we just ask that you would touch them physically that you would be the master physician, that you would work miracles because you are a miracle-working God, and we live in miracle days. So, Lord, we just ask right now that you would give them rest, touch their bodies, bring them back to full health because they are having a hard time being down when they want to minister for you. So we thank you for them. And we just pray your blessing over them. And we pray for your healing over them. And Lord, we just, we know that you're already here, but we want to just take the, the time to invite you into this service, to just say, Lord, we want you here. We know you're here, but we also want your presence here. Would you allow your Holy Spirit to just fill this room so that we can go home and say, I was touched by the Spirit today. 
I felt the moving of his presence. Jesus, we're so grateful for your sacrifice that we were able to benefit from that. Be with us this day. Be with Pastor John as he brings your word. Use his voice to speak your words. We give you this day, and we ask that you would give us the ability to live it our best for you today. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So, um, as everyone knows, October is our Pastor Appreciation Month, and um, we were debating whether to continue and do this today or postpone it because of Pastor's illness, but we decided to honor Pastor John and Pastor Paula and their spouses because without them, they would be hard-pressed doing what they do. So if I could have Pastor John and Pastor Paula come up here, please. Just um, a little acknowledgement from your congregation that loves you very much. And we're just very grateful for everything that you do and stepping in where you need to. <laughs> and um, this difficult time, it's just, it's really hard. But anyway, this is from your congregation. Um, these are for Pastor John and your wife, and Pastor Paula and Jerry. So thank you very much for your service. And I think I can speak for John as well. We love you right back. <laughs> Are we ready for the, did we figure that out? The, okay, so would you like to
do it on another day or would you like to just sign, sign it and we'll just read along yeah. or or you just sign it because we won't know when to unless you say click <laughs> There you go. Okay. It's Thank you for your song. flexibility. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a beautiful song. It's uh, done by Brooks and Dunn. Um, I, it's not a, quote, Christian song, but I find God in lots of places, and I really find God in this song. And I'm a little stiff. I was in a car crash earlier this week. And so muscles are real sore, so it's probably good that I don't have to follow music. <laughs> okay.
What a blessing. Thank you for the technology not working. We take so many things for granted, but we were just given a beautiful picture. I'm blessed. <clears throat> Very blessed. Feels frivolous at this point for me. <laughs> but this box of tissue represents the church and what it should be well. Have you thought about that? The church should be like this box of tissue. If I asked you a question, when I pull a tissue out, did the tissue that I pulled out lift up the next tissue? Don't answer yet. <laughs> or did the tissues inside the box help push the tissue that I pulled out out? Which is the answer? Both. Both. When I pulled this one out, it's connected in such a way that it lifted the other up. The ones that are inside are connected in such a way that they hold this one in place until it's ready to be lifted up. Isn't that the way we are to be as the body of Christ? Our job is to be there to lift up each other when there's a need to lift each other up. But our, our job also as the body of Christ is to hold each other firmly when we need to be held together. So there's two ways that you can look at it, but our job is to be lifter-uppers and to be holder-honors, to be a community together, to go out and do its purpose, whether it's to take care of a drippy nose or to clean a little spot of water the tissue can have many, many purposes. We're all derived from the same body, from that same box. We all go out and do different purposes, but we also are together and we're stronger together and we can strengthen each other so that when we do go out and fulfill our separate purposes, we're coming from a great foundation with like-minded people all going out to achieve the same purpose in our different ways with our different talents. So the next time you see a tissue box, don't just think, oh, tissues, think, I'm just like that tissue box. And then you'll have a chance to outreach because someone's going to look at you and think you're crazy. <laughs> no, no, let me tell you, let me tell you. And then you've just been given a perfect time to give your testimony. So that's what I want you to think of the next time you see a tissue box. Well, let's all stand. We've been sitting long enough. Let's get our, let's get the juices going. If you'd like to, you can turn in your hymnals to page 124. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Page 124. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of 
was raised, he ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him a majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all to him all majesties ascribe and crown him Lord of all last verse Oh that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall we'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all will join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Amen. You may be seated. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me Through the deepest valley he will lead Oh, the night has been won, I shall well overcome Yet not I, but through Christ in me No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. All oh, the chains are released, I 
can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said, that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me to this I hold to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete Till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer.
How about now? There we go. Thank you. Carl, Rita Sari is coming home from therapy tomorrow. <laughs> After four months, praise the Lord. Kevin, thank you for the day off. Honestly, I, um, I love playing guitar. I was called to play guitar when I, um, when I was young for, uh, uh, for the church. I think that's one of the, just as a young person, that's one of the callings that has kind of kept me in the church. Um, but lately, I've just been really appreciating worshiping with, with the congregation, just the words. Uh, so thank you for that, Kevin. All right, folks, you see it. <laughs> Pastor Grady must have the gift of prophecy because a couple of Sundays ago, he said that uh, I was going to be talking about Revelation in my sermon. And uh, at the time, I thought, that's funny because I don't know what I'm going to be talking about in my sermon a couple Sundays from now. Well, this last week, as I was preparing... I had this perfect outline laid out for my sermon, and uh, I was going to talk about the essentials of faith and uh, really the, the components of it, what we need for true faith. And, uh, but then as I began to write it out, the Holy Spirit nudged me, and he said, they already know this. So it's not that the subject of faith isn't important, it's just that because it, it's the very avenue of our salvation. It's just that right now, something else seems a little more relevant. And, uh, well, here's a secret that uh, I've learned after beginning to preach. So, how exactly we, whether uh, me or Pastor Paula really, how we come up with our sermons is quite a mystery. Let's just say that. I, I, uh, if I had more time, I'd probably follow, or uh, more Sundays in a row, I'd probably follow an outline. But, uh, um, but what I'm saying is God seems to communicate to different pastors in different ways on, how to, which, on what message to deliver each Sunday. Would you say that's correct? Yes. Um, lately, though, my approach has been, what do my people need to hear? Where can I help guide the flock? What's in the dark that needs to be brought into the light? What are my people struggling with? I could go on forever about what I want to talk about, uh, but that doesn't always do everybody any good. My high school math teacher used to say that if one person has a question, chances are that someone else has that same question. So she always took questions, didn't matter who had it, if it was just one person. I think the same is true for helping shepherd a church. If one is having concerns or questions or feels a little lost or there are a lot of doubts raised, chances are you are not experiencing that in isolation. Plenty of others are experiencing the same thing. So when I prepare a sermon, I listen to casual conversation. And usually I can pick up a recurring theme. Now, this, and I don't hope that you take this opportunity to say, I want to, oh, I'm really struggling with uh, this subject right here. I want to hear about this. No, no. Um, usually I can just pick up a recurring theme and the Holy Spirit nudges me as in like, yep, it's, it's that. It's that what, that's what I want you to talk about. So one recurring theme I keep overhearing is what it means to have the mark of the beast. Our scripture today comes from Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. He, the beast, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, 
and his number is 666. I'll be honest, this is a topic that I have hesitated to do simply because there are so many widespread opinions that just spread fear. But I think perhaps talking about it, maybe shedding some new perspective on it, will at least address the elephant in the room. This is everywhere. This appears on whether your YouTube suggestions, it's on Facebook, and we haven't really talked about it, I would say. And if we have talked about it, we've heard it from, well, someone else's opinion of it. My brother-in-law has a tattoo on his hand that is about a small asterisk cross-looking symbol um, uh, with uh, some, real, some light strokes around it. And I asked him once, uh, what's that tattoo on your hand? And he said, well, that's so I can get my food. And I said, what? He said, it comes from the Bible. So when, when the government goes after everyone, I can get my food. So I asked him, how do you know what the mark looks like? <laughs> and he said, it's a cross because it comes from the Antichrist. I said, oh, okay. Well, what if the Antichrist wants to use a different symbol or something? And he said, well, then I'll just get that tattooed on my hand. <laughs> I said, no, okay, <laughs> foolproof plan. These few verses have been the catalyst for many fears and superstitions in our culture. Some people think it's computer chips. Some think it's numbers on your credit card. There's no end to the speculation about what the mark of the beast actually is or what it even will be. And it's tempting to just dismiss all those interpretations and just say, just look for the blessed hope. Don't worry about all the other stuff. While that's true, if you want to go back to the other slide, Scripture tells us here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. It doesn't say, wait and see. It actually says that this is wise to do so. In our day, there have been a number of concerns that the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast. Some of us don't go quite that far. Some of us just say that it's merely conditioning for the mark of the beast. Personally, I don't think people are being too crazy for thinking that, but I don't think you can make a very sound scriptural case for it being the mark of the beast itself. Verse 17 says that the mark goes on your right hand or on your forehead. COVID vaccine just goes in your arms, and it doesn't matter which arm it is. Now you might say, okay, but is it conditioning for the mark of the beast? I think it's only conditioning if you get it just because, just because everyone else is getting it. Now, like, and that's just because if that's the way you live your life, just doing whatever is popular, well, you'll inevitably receive the mark of the beast. Um, but if you're taking your own health into consideration, even if the vaccine doesn't end up doing what it's supposedly designed to do, that's not really the mark of the beast. That's, if anything, that's just health officials making promises they didn't know they could keep. Right? Am I too far off on that? Um, I also don't think that we would be thinking about it this way if there wasn't a mandate. If you look at countries like Norway and Singapore, they did not politicize the vaccine. They simply just targeted the demographic that is at risk for it, gave the information. Norway actually even let up their lockdowns because it says it's actually causing more mental health issues than, than otherwise. And so it's really difficult for us to formulate an opinion, especially about scripture, when we haven't taken into consideration that we've been isolated. And where does the devil work? In isolation. 
we have to consider how we approach things and how we view things. What is my mental health state? A lot of us feel like we didn't really have, we didn't really struggle with that beforehand. None of us have ever been on lockdown because of that and looking at a screen the whole time. So we have to consider that, I think, before we, uh, um, before we look at this. And uh, just when I say this, just know I'm not representing the Church of the Nazarene here in this view. I'm not representing Pastor Paula's opinion. I'm not representing Pastor Grady's opinion. Um, and call me old-fashioned, but I don't think you should ever feel guilty or coerced to put something in your body that you're not sure about. Not from the government, not from your job, not even from your family. And no, just because you don't get vaccinated, that doesn't mean that you're responsible for giving people COVID. I hope that just clears the air. But I will say this, though. One of the reasons I got vaccinated was because quite a number of people in our congregation have compromised immune systems. I'm fine. My demographic isn't really at risk for the virus. But if I'm going to be visiting and interacting with the demographic that is most at risk to receive the virus, I'm simply going to do, uh, I'm simply going to do what I can to make sure that I don't get it and that I don't spread it. Seems pretty reasonable. But I'm not so scared of COVID enough to shut down my whole life or make other people shut down their lives just because they refuse it. Not everyone can take a vaccine like this. I don't think you should risk your health just because you're afraid of being stigmatized by your neighbor. It's just my opinion. I know that uh, others disagree and that's perfectly fine. I think just saying something like it kind of just clears the air maybe a bit. So no, I don't think the vaccine is the mark of the beast. I just think our health officials have very little understanding of what they're up against, so we need to pray for them. But rather than being open and honest about that, they just keep making empty promises that only contribute to us stigmatizing each other. That's all I'll say. The mark of the beast will be much clearer than something like a government-mandated COVID vaccine, and it will be much deeper than to be mistaken for a tattoo. John gives us some helpful advice here in verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. I think if we're going to identify the mark of the beast, we first have to identify the significance of the number first. Now, if Revelation applies to all believers in every time, this makes sense as to why John says, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. It is our responsibility as believers to make this sort, this kind of calculation. But it's not necessarily a numeric calculation. We are tasked to identify the spiritual principalities warring against us in this dark world. We are living in that final hour. We always have been. Therefore, we must identify the beast. I would suggest that we have so many varying interpretations as to what the mark of the beast is and what 666 means, not because the equation is incalculable, but because we are either using the wrong calculator or we are using our calculator wrong. When I took pre-calculus and trigonometry in high school, we were required to have these TI-83 Texas instrument calculators. Uh, because a TI-83 can, uh, it can calculate radians, it can uh, do parabolic equations, it can log exponents, it can do sine, cosine, tangent, all that fun stuff. If you were using a calculator that you brought from home, you couldn't do any of those things. And you can't bring your phone because there's no indication that you won't use Google to just look it up. Perhaps that is where we suffer as well. We can just ask Google instead of praying and meditating on what scripture means and then consulting the larger body of Christ. When it comes to calculating the number of the beast, we must remember that scripture is our calculator. Not YouTube, not your favorite preacher, although we don't just dismiss those, not even your favorite Christian Instagram influencer who has full seminary training. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. The word of God, which gives you understanding, is your calculator. 
And it is also essential to remember that when we are calculating any verse from Scripture, that we must calculate it within the confines of the Word of God. Jesus says in John 10.32, And the Scripture cannot be broken. My Christian challenge teacher in college used to tell us all the time that Scripture is its best commentary. This means that all of Scripture, Revelation especially, must be interpreted by itself and by what the rest of Scripture says before we consult other opinions and teachings on it. Can we all agree that that's the rule? Okay, Scripture interprets Scripture. Good. So the last half of that verse, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Some say that 666 is merely a triple, uh, just merely a triple emphasis on six, which, is simply, which simply means short of perfection. The logic is that if the beast's number is 666, then Christ's number is 777. That's a nice thought, and I don't, necessarily, I don't completely disagree with it, but I find that calculation just a little vague because nowhere in scripture, the scripture actually say that God's number is 777 like it directly says that the beast is 666. The preterists would say that 666 refers to Emperor Nero, and while that's also an interesting thought, that doesn't really help us now. If the number of the beast only refers to Roman emperors of the first century, then there's really no reason for us to read Revelation today. The number of the beast should be calculatable. Calculable? Anyway, you know what I mean. We should be able to calculate it in any age, not just when it possibly shows up. So according to our calculator, though, there is one other place in Scripture where the number 666 appears. It appears in 1 Kings 10, 14. The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. What does that mean? Well, I think that's important because I think it, this shows that John, the author of Revelation, is making a direct reference to King Solomon. It is the number of a man, not the number of man in general. And if you go to verse 15, Scripture details that there was more income for Solomon, but God only inspired the authors to write down the number of the annual weight. 666 is the number of King Solomon. When I first read through the book of Kings, I was surprised to learn that Solomon didn't finish well. Now, scripture isn't clear whether Solomon went to paradise or Sheol or Hades or torment at his death, but he is the only inspired writer of scripture who possibly went to hell. 1 Kings 11.4 says that when Solomon was old, his, his 700 wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal, which literally means it was not at peace with the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. He built high places for the God of his wives, the gods of his wives, even for Moloch. And when the Lord divided his house because of it, instead of repenting, he sought to kill his own son. Hold on, John. But that said, that says that Solomon's wives turned him away from the Lord not his money. True, but think about the soil in which that apostasy occurs. Why do you think he had so many wives in the first place? Anyone who says they don't want to marry because they have too much love to go around does not really know what it means to love one person. The truth is that Solomon became greedy. This would have never happened if Solomon had not continued to receive the annual weight of 666 talents. Scripture tells us to focus on that number, and since that's the only other direct reference to 666 that we have in Scripture, I believe it's safe to conclude what Andrew Caesarea concluded in the 6th century, that 666 refers to the love of money. Not money in general, but the love of money. For which, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6-10, through 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. That's the key word. Greediness. That was the fate of Solomon. God gave him the income and trade of the entire Mediterranean world. 
Yet he had to, he had to have that number of 666 talents every year. Solomon died an idolater because he became greedy. The number of the beast is the number of a man. His number is 666. My calculator says that the number of the beast is greed, which Paul says is idolatry. Greed shows us how Satan is able to raise both beasts in Revelation 13 to power. Notice that in Revelation 13, the beast is not Satan himself. In this passage, Satan is still identified as the dragon from chapter 12. Satan is not the beast, but he gives authority to both beasts. This is Revelation 13, 1, the latter half through 4. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon, that Satan, gave him power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it would, had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And this horrendous creature is not to be confused with the beast that then rises out of the earth. That was the beast out of the sea. This is Revelation 13, 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He, is grant, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. The beast, the one called out of the earth, the one that ri rises out of the earth, is the one who causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark. The year I began teen ministry, General Superintendent J.K. Warwick spoke at Holiness Camp. Do we remember that? The Sunday before he did so, he visited us at Fourth Plain. At the time, I happened to be going through Revelation with the teens. And J.K. told me that the best book on Revelation that he has ever read is called More Than Conquerors by William Hendrickson. When I was taking my New Testament class at Nazarene Bible College with the district, Reverend Mark K. Justice said the same thing. So I decided, okay, I'll buy this book if it's got so much uh, hype and uh, praise around uh, Nazarene pastors. I'll give it a try. And let me tell you, that book counts as devotional material, in my opinion. Uh, More Than Conquerors is the most thoroughly coherent reading of Revelation that I have read so far. And it's not written for scholars either. He even teaches you, or maybe even reminds you, how to read Scripture altogether. I highly recommend it to anyone who is interested in a textually coherent perspective on Revelation. What's interesting about this book is Hendrickson doesn't view Revelation simply as one vision that just chronicles consecutive events, right? Usually we read Revelation in order where we think, oh, this happens, and this happens, and this happens. Rather, he sees it as the same vision viewed at different angles. What he means by that is, in other words, Chapters 4 through 7 take place from, from Christ's first coming to Christ's second coming. Chapters 8 through 11 take place from Christ's first coming to Christ's second coming. Chapters 12 through 14 take place through Christ's first coming through Christ's second coming. The same is true for chapters 15 and 16, 17 and 19, 20 and 22. And each section has a different angle of the end times but they all chronicle the general vision of the final hour, which according to 1 John 2.18 is now. And I buy this interpretation because this explains why Revelation seems to start over in some places. Say, for example, in chapter 12, we see that Christ is sudden, we see the birth of Christ suddenly in the middle of the book. And why we also see hints of the final judgment in chapter 14. 
and why John seems to change angles uh, throughout the vision. Unless we're going to say that Christ keeps coming back around seven times, we should see Revelation as seven different angles of the same story. And if we go with this interpretation, it means that Revelation 13 describes a reality that all believers share before the second coming of Christ. So according to Hendrickson, the beast out of the sea is anti-Christian government. And the beast out of the earth is anti-Christian religion or philosophy. The beast out of the sea takes the form of any governing authority that persecutes Christians or Christian values. This is verse 7. It was granted to him, the beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Humans have a long history of idolizing and worshiping their governing authorities. And Christians have a long history of interfering and disrupting that system. When John was writing Revelation, the Roman government was persecuting Christians because they refused to even call Caesar Lord. As Christians, we serve our government, but we do not worship it. I would venture to say that that is a symptom of a weakening society. If we are expecting the government to serve us, protect us, to keep us safe in every aspect of our lives before we take, before we take responsibility for ourselves. Unfortunately, while we are on this side of heaven, that approach is incredibly foolish because no government is safe from Satan's jurisdiction. The only people Satan cannot govern are those whose names are written in the book of life. As it says in verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, the beast, whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Worship of the beast is inevitable and even a reality if your name is not written in the book of life. If you do not worship God, you are at risk to worship a tyrannical government. But anti-Christian government has a co-worker, and that is anti-Christian religion. According to Hendrickson, this is the identity of the beast out of the earth. Notice that this beast is not as horrific or even as huge as the first one. Instead, John compares him to a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. Hendrickson says this, Although this beast outwardly resembles the lamb, it inwardly conceals the dragon. The beast looks very innocent, a nice little lamb, a pet for the children. But speech reveals the inner thought, life, essence, and character. And this lamb speaks like the devil himself. This second beast, accordingly, is the lie of Satan dressed up like the truth. It is Satan masquerading as a shining angel, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. It symbolizes all false prophets in every era of this dispensation, which is this uh, time frame. They come disguised as sheep, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. On the outside, anti-Christian religion, anti-Christian philosophy, even propaganda, appears soft like a lamb. But on the inside, it is a ravaging wolf. It bites, it devours, it spews fire, and even kills everything that contradicts its teaching. What's even worse is that this is the dominant view of the culture. It has the authority. That's what verse 12 says. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. The beast of the earth gives life to... Uh, the beast of the earth, sorry, gives life to how people view the beast out of the sea. Just as anti-Christian religion gives life to anti-Christian government. What that means is that it makes anti-Christian government a reality. Did you know that the Nazis had their own form of Christianity? It was called positive Christianity. One of the attractions of positive Christianity was that it was anti-credal, which really meant that it was anti-institutional. They basically, they basically said you do not have to worship as a body in order to be Christian. It was normalized 
by a distrust in any form or institution of corporate Christianity. Because really, anyone who abides by any form or institution, well, in their minds, is just a hypocrite. And it surely meant that you couldn't be Catholic. But it also meant that you were ostracized if you were Lutheran, Reformed, or even Anglican. Positive Christianity also reinforced the conception of Jesus as a blonde-haired, uh, blonde-haired boy with blue eyes, and a Jesus who was anti-Semitic. The Nazis even used Luther's words to back up their hermeneutic. As Hitler said, if a lie is told often enough, everyone will believe it. Positive Christianity gave life to a false image of Christ, and those who did not know the real Christ could not, and even would not, recognize the difference. This form of Christianity was a way for those who called themselves Christians in Nazi Germany to participate in segregating Jewish people. Nazi Germany was a form of the beast out of the sea. Positive Christianity was a form of the beast out of the earth. And those who accepted it, accepted Hitler's reign, and really worshipped him. But those who didn't ended up being martyrs and heroes. Corrie ten Boom's father, whose name was surely written in the Book of Life, countered the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth in Nazi Germany by signing up for a gold star and saying that the Jews gave us our savior. They also hid families upon families of Jews in their walls and in their attics. It cost them their business, their livelihood, and their lives, except for Corrie. They were arrested and taken to a concentration camp while they were reading Romans 8. Just because the government isn't directly persecuting Christians doesn't mean it's not an anti-Christian government. Nazi Germany was only one head of the beast out of the sea in the 20th century. Soviet Russia was another head. Mao's China, another. We could go on. But the point is that it's never just one government at a time, and whatever form of government the beast out of the sea rears its ugly head in. Whatever form it does rear its ugly head, there follows the beast out of the earth. All these governments hailed their leaders with cultish pride or undue reverence and made their people receive some sort of mark or symbol for it, which if they did not receive or at least accept, they would have been imprisoned and tortured and removed of their livelihoods. In our day, the beast out of the sea takes the form of progressivism. The ironic thing about progressivism is that it has no unifying structure other than attempting to reform or dismantle everything deemed antiquated. It has become a seven-headed beast that justifies and insinuates violence and anger in the name of social justice. The heads of this beast today take the form of social liberation movements like the entitlement to abortion, eugenics, the LGBTQ movement, third-wave feminism, critical race theory, no-fault divorce, and the destruction of the family, the list goes on. All these issues seem distinct and separate, but they contain the same cultish spirit, which if you disagree with, you will have the potential to lose your very livelihood. Regardless of where those movements came from, or what actual progress some of them may have done in the past, you cannot argue that they have not become anti-Christian movements against the church and her teachings today. And I very well say that this is the beast out of the sea because our government institutions are not only accepting these movements, they are encouraging them as normal. And the beast out of the earth, the false prophet harboring acceptance for these movements and causing all to worship the beast, is a wolf in sheep's clothing called progressive Christianity. This form of Christianity claims to liberate people from traumatic religious experiences, but, it, but all it does is destroy the church. Whether it's the evangelical movement or the academic pressure to deconstruct your faith, it only ends up indoctrinating bitterness and self-justified hatred for those who have hurt you, even if your hurt is legitimate. It contributes to the creation of a false image of Jesus, one who hates religious hypocrites and allows anyone who isn't religious to sin as they please. If totalitarian rule comes to America like it did in Hitler's Germany, conservative Christians will be painted as the enemies. That said, we have to keep in mind that the beast has another head. 
This is verses 8 through 9. It warns us of this. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience or perseverance and the faith of the saints. Those who take up the sword, says Christ to Peter, will perish by the sword. This is the rule that keeps the saints on the narrow road. As Christians, when the beast of the sea rears one of its seven ugly heads, we cannot afford to lose ourselves to aggression. God does not have compassion on people just because they're victims. He has compassion on those who want to be saved. And the question for us Christians is, do we want to save our world, or do we want to be saved from the world? Do we also worship an image we've made in our heads of how the world should be, what we deserve from God? The false prophet doesn't have to take the form of progressive Christianity. In fact, progressive Christianity is just another face of entitlement. But we all struggle with that. If we lose ourselves to aggression, doesn't that mean that we've lost sight of where our rights actually are? Our rights aren't stored in a legislative body or a government entity, or even a constitutional document. We have our rights, whether the government recognizes it or not. They're God-given, not government-given. And the government isn't God. Perhaps if we had that approach, being thankful for our rights, rather than frustrated for injustice, we would not only keep ourselves from the greediness that runs from crucifixion, we may even draw others out of being greedy for recognition. The mark of the beast goes much deeper than a vaccine, a tattoo, or even a political rival. It is the spirit of the Antichrist. It is engraved on the mind and in possession of the will. One of the fears that surrounds the mark of the beast is a, this prevailing assumption that once you receive the mark, you can't take it back. This seems to be how Revelation 14 depicts it, if you read it that way. But Scripture doesn't say that. And I find that assumption to go way too far. As Wesleyans, we may not exactly believe in eternal security, at least in this life. But we don't believe that the devil has a greater hold on us than God. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. God's grace is always greater than our sin. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's 1 John 4.4. 4. The devil's people may get a mark, but God's people get a seal. If you have borne the image of the beast and have let his philosophies govern your life, you can repent. And the reason I know this is because I've repented of anti-Christian government and anti-Christian philosophy. Perhaps I may have mentioned this in the past. I was pretty woke during college. Even coming out of college, I used to not care what people did with their bodies. I had no idea what I was saying when I dismissed abortion as tolerable. I even wrote a paper in high school defending the legality of gay marriage before it was legal. I was very agreeable to anyone except for the religious literalists I could pick on. And as I look back on those years of basically being a half-Christian, I think, well, no wonder I didn't bear fruit. I was a walking contradiction. I look back on my life now and the conversations I was having with people before I got married and with the unjustified disdain and bitterness I had for the church. I used to mock Christians who showed any hint of being conservative because I thought of them as moronic anti-intellectuals. But the truth is, I didn't understand how the world worked. And I am glad that I am at fourth plane now because of it. All I can think when I look at the way I used to talk to people are David's words in Psalm 25. Oh Lord, please do not condemn me for the sins of my youth. I am thankful to God that I had people praying for me and who saw my talents while I was unwittingly serving Satan all those years. And I just want to say that if I can come out of it, I believe you can too, anyone who's listening here or anyone who's listening online. If you've been hurt by the church, 
the worst thing you can do for your salvation is join a community that keeps you bitter about it. Harboring unforgiveness, even toward religious zealots, is still unjustified in God's eyes. But having come on the flip side, I can also testify that anger and wrath toward what you used to be, and even the world in general, is also a mark of the Antichrist. Living by the sword, by backbiting, mockery, gossiping, etc., is running from crucifixion. We are called to be hurt. We are called to be betrayed. We are called to be confused, alienated, and stigmatized because we are sealed. Blessed are you, says Christ, when people insult you and ridicule you and say all kinds of things falsely about you for my sake. Great is your reward in heaven. Let's not lose our reward fighting for our rights. Let's pray for our rights to be the gospel. Would you stand with me for the benediction? I hope, folks, that maybe this has cleared some air. The mark of the beast is something far worse than the COVID vaccine. It is the impenitence of a culture counter to Christ and his church. It is the legalism on the soul even after you've been saved. Most of all, it is the spirit that causes you to trust yourself over Christ. But if you are in Christ, you have all you need to distinguish between right and wrong. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things, John says in 1 John 2.20. You may not know exactly how to handle every situation, but you certainly know what not to join yourself to. You have an anointing, a seal, that helps you distinguish the Spirit of God from that of the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the, the privilege and honor that it is to to calculate your word. And Lord, I ask as we go out today that we become more discerning, not just about what to be separate from, but what to dedicate ourselves to. Lord, let us not live by the sword in resistance, in rebellion, in personal anger and wrath. Let us not feed that addiction but let us take time to receive the good news that we are sealed by the victor. We are sealed by the one, the to this I hold. My sin has been defeated. And Lord, I ask that even though we've been focusing on some of the bad stuff to look for, that we just see you in the midst of it. We see you through it because we have no choice but to do that. And I ask, Lord, just as Pastor Paula pointed out, that in that sense, we act as tissues. It may feel isolating at first, but Lord, we're not alone as a body. We're never alone when we're with your spirit. Bless us now, Lord. You are blessing us. Let us continue to be the body for each other and for the world. In your precious name, amen. There was a guy who lived at... Uh